Okay, so we're looking at some more algorithms on large numbers, and uh, we're going to head towards multiplication today. Uh, last class, we looked at addition, and here's the algorithm that we came up with for doing standard addition, the same way that you learned in school. And we figured out that this has a linear cost, the sum of the two input sizes. And whenever we have a sum in the complexity, what it really means is that it's the larger, um, the largest or longest array length. Um, that's what corresponds to the cost of adding two large numbers. Then we wanted to ask like, hey, is this the best that's possible? Um, and it turns out that this is the best possible asymptotically um, because we can prove that for any addition algorithm, uh, we always need to take at least that much time in order to solve it. And this is a special class of lower bounds. So this is similar to like the lower bound on sorting that we saw, but it's actually much less complicated. It's just a linear time lower bounds to say that the input size, um, here the input size is the log x plus log y because that's the size of the two representations of the numbers. But whatever that input size is, um, we can say that that input size is a lower bound if we have this condition that changing any part of the input could change the answer. So what does this mean for addition? Um, if we change any digit of either number, so you're adding two numbers up, if you change just one digit by you know increasing it or decreasing it by one, then you must get a different result, right? So it's not just that it, it could change the answer, it must change the answer. Um, and so therefore we can say that if we had an algorithm for addition that didn't take um, log x plus log y time, so didn't take linear time in the size of the input, then that would mean that there's some digit in the input. We don't, can't say which one it is, but there'd be some digit that that algorithm is going to give the same answer even if that digit changes. So if we had an algorithm which was faster than linear time, it would give the same answer even though we changed that digit, therefore it would give the wrong answer. Um, so this says that any algorithm um, must take at least uh, log x plus log y time. That's the size of the input, the size of those two lists. And so now, since we saw an algorithm which takes big theta of log x plus log y, and we know that any algorithm for this problem has to take at least log x plus log y, that means that that algorithm that we just saw is asymptotically optimal. So this kind of gets the gold star, or in this case, pink star, um, for being optimal, asymptotically optimal. And just as a reminder, what this means is that we have an algorithm whose big theta running time is the smallest that it could possibly be considering any possible algorithm for this problem. So are there other like tricks that could be used, other small improvements in order to do addition a little bit faster? For sure. Um, there may be various tricks or, or various ways that we could do this a little bit faster, but asymptotically, we could never do it faster than this. Um, we can never improve by more than like a constant factor from this method that you learned in third grade because it has to look at at least every digit of both inputs. Because um, any algorithm that didn't look at every digit of both inputs would be wrong sometimes when those digits might change. Okay, so this is a powerful lower bound technique. It's a little bit subtle. What I want to mostly emphasize is that what we didn't say so the argument was not, see, I'm not even going to write this down because it's a bad argument. So what I'm about to say is a bad, wrong argument. What we didn't say was um, it, has to, it has to look at every digit. Therefore, it's at least linear time. That's like kind of um, circular reasoning, right? We're trying to prove that it has to look at every single digit. And the, re the reason why we can say that is because any algorithm that did less than linear amount of work would be wrong sometimes. We're not just saying that every algorithm has to work exactly the way that our algorithm did. We're just saying that any algorithm which somehow would claim to do this faster, I could trick that algorithm into giving a wrong answer. 
And that's how I know that this is the lower bound that applies not just to our algorithm, but to any algorithm for this problem. Okay, so addition is kind of like wrapped up. We, the algorithm that we kind of all came up with to do it is already the asymptotically optimal one. We can do subtraction in basically the same way, just changes all the digits to negative and you do the same thing. Um, but so what's next is going to be uh, multiplication then. And so multiplication turns out to be much more interesting, um, much more rich area of study and investigation. And so let's check this out. First, let's think about how to do multi-digit multiplication. You probably learned something in third grade. So let me go through a couple different ways that I think you might have learned how to multiply numbers. Here's how I learned. If I want to do like 267 times um, 592, you start by multiplying the last digits. So like this is 14 and then move up like this. So 2 times 6 is 12, plus 1 is 13. And then 2 times 2 is 4, plus 1 is 5. Then cross out the carries and move on. We're now kind of like finished with this 2. So now I'm going to move on and multiply everything in the top number times the middle digit. So now everything is going to get multiplied by 9. So 7 times 9 is 63. And I also move over one place here. 6 times 9 is 54, plus 6 is 60. And 9 times 2 is 18, plus 6 is 24. Okay, so now I cross those out. I can forget about the 9. And now I do the same thing with the 5 and shifting one more place over. So uh, 5 times 7 is 35. 5 times 6 is 30, plus 3 is 33. 5 times 2 is 10, plus 3 is 13. So overall, now I have to add these up. So I add these up, and now that's going to be 4, 6, um, 10. So I carry the 1. This is an 8, 5, and 1. 1, 5, 8, 0, 6, 4, and that's great. Now let's think about how much work we actually did there. How many digit times digit multiplications? Well, I basically had to multiply every digit times every other digit. And then I have to, everything that I'm writing down here is um, all those individual digit products. So what this ends up being is every digit in X times every digit in Y. And so the total cost of this method is like log of x times log of y. All right. Um, there's another method that looks pretty different. And so I, I want to look at it. If you haven't seen this method before, then I hope you enjoy it. And it's called sometimes it's called like the square method or the box method. So we can make a big box and I'm going to split it up into a three by three box. Then I make each of these boxes into a diagonal. All right. And now what I'm going to do is write my numbers that I'm multiplying. I write one of them across the top, like 267. And the other one I write across the side, but backwards, like 592. And why is this is because I want to line up like at this end of the spectrum, like this should be the ones digit. And this should be like the the high order digit. Like the most significant digits over here. So five and two are the most significant digits. So they meet at this corner. Seven and two are the least significant digits. So they meet at this corner. And now what I'm going to do is multiply each pair of digits and write the two digit answer um, in these diagonal boxes. So like two times seven is 14. So I write one, four, two times six is 12. So I write 12, two times two is four. So I write zero, four. Okay. Then the same for the next line, nine times two, and I can do these in any order I want. Nine times two is 18, nine times six is 54, nine times seven is 63, five times two is 10, five times six is 30. 5 times 7 is 35. 
So I've just done all of those um, digit times digit multiplications, and now I add diagonally. So you add diagonally down. So here I'm just adding 4 plus itself, so that is 4. Then I'm adding everything in this diagonal. 2 plus 1 plus 3 is 6. 4 plus 1 plus 4 plus 6 plus 5. That is equal to 20. So I write a 0 and I carry the 2. Now 2 plus 0 plus 8 plus 5 plus 0 plus 3 is 18. So I write the 8 and carry the 1. This comes out to be 5 and this is 1. And so what we get along the outside is 158064. It's the same answer that we got right here. Um, so some people I know might have learned this method to do multiplication. It's the same thing really as this one, it's just we write it out differently. What I like about this one is it really illustrates that the cost is in terms of the number of digits in one number times the number of digits in the other number. And then I get like a two digit product for each one and then I have to do some additions. But the number of additions of digits that I'm doing is basically the same as the number of multiplications. So either way, I get this same exact cost, which is log x times log y. And another way of writing this, if uh, just because it gets annoying as we get into more complicated things of writing always like log x and log y, is we usually care about the number of digits. So if I say n equals the maximum number of digits in either number, then this cost is big theta of n times n, so n squared. So it's a quadratic time algorithm um, in order to mul do multiplication. Okay, cool. So this is how you learned um, how to do multiplication in grade school. Even if you did it some slightly other different way, I can virtually guarantee that um, this is that the way that you learn how to do long number multiplication um, comes out to be quadratic time. The size, the length of um, one number in terms of how many digits times the length of the other number. And so here's how we'll do this in a computer. It's called the standard multiplication algorithm. It's basically doing the same thing that we just saw, um, but with one important difference. And the difference is the way that it adds things up. So what you notice here is that these take quadratic amount of time, but they also take quadratic amount of space. So it's very obvious in this square method that the total amount of space, what we have to store, is kind of um, quadratic because it's the product of the one digit size, one number size times the other number size. But now imagine if you were trying to save space here. So one thing that we can do with computers very easily, but which is kind of different with um, numbers, uh, sorry, with paper, is that we can erase. So when could we erase like this four? Well, as soon as we just add it to itself when we write out the four, then we could get rid of this value. So we could kind of wipe that out. We could also imagine then computing this next sum, like adding these parts, then summing this up, getting the six, and then like wiping that out. So if we, if we did this like down each diagonal and then forgot about those numbers as soon as we added them up, what would happen is that we don't actually have to bite, but we could just keep like overwriting the same memory, um, keeping track of like a running sum. And if we do things in just the right order, like we would start with two times seven, then we would do two times six and nine times seven. Then we would do two times two, nine times six, and five times seven. So always kind of like moving along a diagonal. Um, if you do that, then it turns out that you only need a little bit of extra memory in addition to the space for the output. And so that's what this algorithm does. Again, it's the same idea. It's just uh, doing things a little bit um, more efficiently in order to save space. So what we do is we're multiplying x times y. And so we're going to have the output and a temporary array t. And so what we do every time is multiply like one more digit and then add that one to the running sum. And you could even do this without this temporary array t. But the idea is the same. Um, this is going to be, um, you know, quadratic time. So big O, uh, big theta of log x times log of y. 
Remember, the base doesn't matter because that just turns out to be a constant difference. And so again, if we're thinking about n digit numbers, um, so n being the length of longer input, this is really just n squared. Now, of course, what we want to think about is, uh, is this the best thing that's possible? Could we improve on this? What does this actually mean? Notice that it's a lot slower than addition. Um, so for example, if we, if we thought about like um, the kind of numbers for RSA, maybe with a thousand digits, adding 2000 digit numbers takes about a thousand steps. That's what we saw with addition. Multiplying 2000 digit numbers takes about a million steps. So it's much slower. Um, and if you scale that up to a million digit numbers, then it would be, you know, seconds versus hours uh, that it would take to do addition versus multiplication. And so we want to think about, um, and it's a question that's long been pursued of, is there any faster way to do this? Um, so we kind of hinted that divide and conquer algorithms are going to be a big deal in this unit. So let's come try and see if we can come up with a divide and conquer algorithm for multiplication. What does it mean to split uh, digits in half, to split a number in half, right? So for divide and conquer, we want to split the numbers into like, we want to split the inputs into equal sized parts. And then we want to uh, recursively solve each sub problem on smaller parts and then combine them back together. So like if we're multiplying 7407 times 2915, these two numbers right here, X and Y, uh, what does it mean to split them in half? Well, uh, it really means like splitting the digits in half. So we would split X into 7 and 74, and we would split Y into 15 and 29. So in, in terms of thinking about arrays, it's like taking the first half of the array and the second half of the array, the first half of the array and the second half of the array. And so now we have to kind of think about mathematically, we have the idea of how to split it up. Now, how do we like put those answers back together? And it's, and it's basically by, um, by this, you just FOIL. So it's a uh, FOIL that you probably remember learning about in terms of how to multiply quadratics. This is just exactly what comes out if we write out mathematically, we have x0 plus b to the n times x1 times y0 plus b to the m times y1. Um, that just equals this, this thing up here x0, y0, plus blah, 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 blah. Um, and so what you can see is this is a way of multiplying these two numbers. Um, essentially, how to multiply two four-digit numbers by doing, two, by doing four two-digit number multiplications and then adding up the middle parts. Um, so let me show you exactly how this would work. Okay, let's think about how this would work is we have to multiply each part. So we're trying to split them down the middle. So we have like four two digit numbers now, and we have to multiply each pair of them. Um, so like this would be X1 and X0. This would be Y1 and Y0. So now I wanna say what's X0 times Y0? Uh, what is X1 times Y0? what's x um, zero times y one and x one times y one. And now each one of those we can do recursively. Um, I'm going to just fill in these values based on what I know that they're equal to. Okay, so there's the, t the four multiplications of two digit numbers. And the way that we would do this is by recursion, right? So I'm not getting into the details because we're just assuming that that happens by recursion. But you can imagine that the base case is when would happen just one more level down when you get down into one digit times one digit numbers. Okay, um, so we assume that that works by recursion. Now, how do we, we have these four intermediate products, how do we put them back together? Well, we have to use this formula. And what you notice is that you get x0 and y0 down here by itself, but x0, y1 and x1, y0 both get added together and then uh, x1, y1 ends up at the top. So what is b to the m 
is like the power of B um, that corresponds to the breaking point here. So here's, we, we broke it halfway through at two, length two. So B to the M equals 10 squared is 100. And so that's what's gonna be the dividing point. So when we add these together, what we're gonna get is X zero and Y zero goes to the bottom, so 105. Now we're gonna add these two numbers together, but they're both gonna be shifted over by two. Okay, so 1110, 1110, and 203. Notice that we shifted over by two because that's the breaking point in those sizes. And then uh, x1 times y1 is 2146. So that's gonna get shifted over by four. So two, one, four, six, like this. So that got shifted by four because it's two times two, two M. And now I add them up. So two, one, five, nine, one, four, zero, five, 7407 times 2915 and I get 2159-1405. And so you can see that that number exactly matches up right here. So our recursive method works. Um, it's annoying to do by hand, but it's nice to do, um, we have this divide and conquer method that actually works. So we reduced two, um, the multiplication of two four digit numbers down to four two digit number multiplications and then some additions to kind of fix them up. And so overall what we get here is that this divide and conquer way has this recurrence down here. So what is this N? That's the cost of the extra additions at the end. And the four is the number of sub problems. So that's the number of small two digit multiplications I had to do. And then N is the extra cost of doing those additions. Essentially, this, this addition down here, this whole thing costs um, big theta of n time, and these four recursive steps cost four times t of n over two time, because they're all on half as large numbers. So now let's think about solving this recurrence. We know that this one up here, we already kind of said that it was quadratic, and we've seen this same kind of running time before. This is the same as selection sort. And so standard multiplication costs big theta of n squared. We already kind of figured that out, um, but that's what it looks like in terms of a recurrence. Because basically what's happening is that you're just taking off one digit from one of the numbers at every step along the way, but the other number is always staying the same size. Here with this divide and conquer way, you're dividing both numbers by half every time. So what is this? We have not seen a recurrence just like this before, so let's figure it out. Um, we have n plus four times t of n over two. Okay, we have not seen this exact recurrence before, so let's think about how we could solve this. I'm actually gonna add a new page so we have somewhere to work. So the recurrence that we're trying to solve is t of n is n plus two times t of, uh, sorry, four times t of n over two. So we don't know what this comes out to be yet, but we can think about, have we seen anything remotely like this? Well, we have seen, if this was a two, we know that this is then the same as merge sort, like n log n. So what we know, what we should think about is that it's at least, and probably more expensive than merge sort. Uh, I just mentioned that to point out that when you see a recurrence that's new and different than what we've seen before, even if you can relate it to some recurrence you know, that at least gives us a starting point. So that if we do a bunch of work to solve this and it comes out to be like square root of n, we know that that must be wrong. Because we, whatever we come up with has to be at least n log n. It has to be at least as much as it would be if this 4 were 2. And in fact, it should probably be more than n log n. Um, okay, so let's start to work this out through substitution. So this is n plus four times, and now I'm just gonna substitute in n over two for everything here. So I'm replacing this t of n over two. So that's gonna be n over two plus four t of n over two divided by two. 
and expand that again, we get n plus 2n, so this is 4n over 2, right? So 2n plus 16 times t of n over 4. <clears throat> All right, let's go another step. We get n plus 2n, that'll stay there. And now what's this one going to be? It's going to be 16 times n over 4. So that's going to be 4n plus 16 times 4 times t of n over 8. So what's 16 times 4? That's 64 t of n over 8. All right, let's do one more just to make sure we have the pattern. So what's going to happen next is going to be 64 times n over 8. So that's going to be 8n plus, then this is going to get multiplied by 4 again. So 64 times 4. Now I have to think about powers of 2. 64 is 2 to the 6. So 64 times 4 is 2 to the 8, which is 256. So that'd be 256t of n over 16. What you should notice is that this coefficient in front of the last term is really growing quickly. Um, and so this is going to be a summation of these powers of the, the, these uh, increasing powers of 2 times n, where they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger every time. And so what really matters is how big does this number get once we get down to the base case? Well, to think about that, we can see that in general, this last term is, so 256, it turns out this is growing by powers of 4. So this is like 4 to the i times t of n over 2 to the i. So now we want to say, how big does i have to be to hit the base case? Well, we hit the base case when i equals log base 2 of n. So then what this is going to come out to be is 4 to the log base 2 of n. How can we figure out what that means? Well. This is log base 2, so I want this to be in terms of 2 as well. So that's 4 is 2 squared. So we can just rewrite 4 is 2 squared. And now we can change the order of the exponents. So this is 2 to the log base 2 of n squared, which is n squared. And so these, these additional terms at the beginning, those matter, but you can see that this is like a Zeno's paradox, like doubling summation, where only the last term is going to determine what the total big theta is. And so the last term in this summation is going to be n squared. That means that the whole thing is big theta of n squared. So this is big theta of n squared running time. What do you think of that? Let's look back. So we just figured out that this recurrence is big theta of n squared. And what that means is that we did a whole bunch of work. We came up with a more complicated algorithm where we split everything in half, very sophisticated, divide and conquer. We're feeling very good about ourselves. And then what we discover at the end is that it's still big theta of n squared. It's the same exact asymptotic running time as the simpler standard multiplication algorithm. Our fancy divide and conquer technique bought us exactly nothing. Um, and so that's where we're going to leave it for now. And you should be now thinking of one of two possibilities. Either maybe n squared is inherently the best we can do. So maybe we can try to get a lower bound to show that n squared is the best that we could hope for for multiplication. Or maybe there is a way to get it faster, but we have to have some new idea, something that we haven't thought of yet. Um, and so I'll leave you with those two possibilities for now and see you next time.